Hello, Fargo. Thank you. First, I want to thank Heidi for giving me another reason to come back to North Dakota. I want to thank Pam Gullison for making that brave, gutty, intelligent, and I hope winning race for Congress. And I want to thank Kent Conrad for a thousand things. But mostly, I want to thank him for the work we did together in the eight years I was president, for always making sense, and unlike some people in politics today, always believing in arithmetic. <laughs> when, you know, Kent was one of the relatively few members of Congress that did not lose any of his common sense genes when he went to Washington, D.C. And I kept thinking, you know, if it were legal, we could do a special form of gene therapy, and we'd extract a few from Kent and just inject it at the base of the brain of about 50 other members of Congress, and poof, we could solve all the problems of America. I want to say, first of all, I, I did love my trip to Grand Forks. I love celebrating the 15th anniversary of the flood, not because we remembered the flood, but because I could see what the people had done there. And I was honored to be a small part of that, to be your partner. But it proves something. It proves that when people work together, it, that's a lot better than you're on your own. When something like that happens, all of a sudden everybody wakes up in the real world and says, what are we going to do? There is no Democrat or Republican way to recover from a flood. And nobody could say it was the bad old government giving money to our neighbors where people from all over America were happy to contribute to help North Dakota come back from that awful, awful event. And where the business community and the local government, everybody was just working together. And after 15 years, they're really proud, and they should be. And I also want to thank you. I asked Heidi if I could say this tonight, and she said I could. Fargo, the film, <laughs> was the cult film of Air Force One during my second term. And <laughs> you need to know that I am not exaggerating this. Anybody who was on my staff will tell you it was shown at least 25 times in the last two and a half years I was president. And we would show it, and the, when the staff got tired of it, the press corps would demand we show Fargo again. And there were all these contests about how many lines from the movie the various reporters and staff members could utter before the actors said them. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty cool. And then Heidi told me that the wood chipper is in the local museum. <laughs> and that if I gave a really effective speech tonight and I were a very nice boy, someday I could see the wood chipper. I'd kind of like to have it for a few days before the election, if you want to. <laughs> anyway, let me say um, a few things seriously. First of all, in my family, we respect Heidi Heitkamp for a lot of reasons. And not just because she's a member of my political party. I like her because she's independent, she thinks for herself, and she tries to get something done. Don't you think a lot of these political ads are kind of silly? <laughs> I mean, really, they make mountains out of molehills, and even worse, they make 
mountainous decisions in the molehills. They major in the minor, minor in the majors, and they blur the distinctions. I heard what Kent Conrad said. I, I, I'm a Democrat because I believe that we're all in this together, works better than you're on your own. I believe that a goal of shared responsibilities and shared prosperity works better than trickle down in economic policy. I believe, I believe that you can make way better policy if you concentrate on evidence instead of ideology. And I know you can make better budgets if you concentrate on arithmetic instead of illusion. And so, but that doesn't mean we're all a bunch of rubber stamps. It ought to tell you something that Heidi's opponent keeps saying she's a clone for Harry Reid. Now, I know Harry Reid. <laughs> and he is a friend of mine. And Heidi Heidkamp is not Harry Reid. And it's sort of insulting. And she, I can tell you this, she's not going to be anybody's doormat in the Senate. And I know, because when I was president, she knew how much I liked her, and she sued me and beat me in court. And not only that, I mean, she sued me, the federal government, and she was right. I'll never forget this case. You know, the president can't keep up with every last thing that's going on. The Fish and, Wild, Fish and Wildlife Service had protected wetlands in a relatively small area that flooded. The farmers who'd landed flooded wanted to clear the land and get their land back, and they did. And the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to sue them, even charge them criminally, because they figured once the flood turned 30 acres into 60, they had a 60-acre wetland, even though they only got permission for a 30-acre wetland. How dumb is that? <laughs> I mean, I guess you got to be from a farming state like me to know, but if that happened in Arkansas every time we turned around, there wouldn't be 100 yards you could walk without stepping on a wetland, because <laughs> everything floods once in a while. Anyway, she sued us and she beat us, and it was a good thing because it protected North Dakota's interests, but it also said the rule of law and common sense should govern, and no, no federal agency is immune from making mistakes, and all of them should be held accountable when they do. She did that. And I'll tell you something else she did where we were on the same side and needed help. As Attorney General, she was a major force in fighting for the Violence Against Women Act. And it was really important because domestic violence was then, still is, but really was then a huge problem in America. And there needed to be some way of having a uniform framework, not only of trying to protect the victims of domestic violence, but helping them recover from it and giving them a path to go forward. So we passed it. Now, and you should be very proud of that. Now, here's why it's important in the Senate race. Because her opponent voted to allow domestic violence to be classified as a pre-existing condition in health insurance. Now look, one of the reasons Heidi's right that this health care bill should be amended where it's wrong, not repealed outright, is this. Because before that law passed, women regularly paid higher health insurance premiums than men did for the same coverage, sometimes as much as 50% higher, partly because things like having been the victim of domestic violence could be used as a pretext to charge them more on the theory that if they got beat up bad enough, they might get sick more often. 
I'm not making this up. So if you want a dose of North Dakota common sense on this issue, you should vote for Heidi Heitkamp for the Senate and make sure she goes. Now, there's a lot of issues I want to mention, but I'd like to just start with this budget. And let's just take a little walk through memory lane here. In the last 51 years, there have been exactly five balanced budgets or surpluses in Washington. President Johnson's last budget had a tiny surplus, and then there were the last four I had. Four in a row for the first time in more than 80 years. Now, I hate all this debt, but you can't get blood out of a turnip. When Kent Conrad served on the bipartisan Simpson Bowles Commission, he voted for a plan that made sense and added up. Nobody in the world, including Ken Conrad, agreed with every detail of the Simpson Bowles plan. I may be the only person in this room that's actually read every word of it. But you know, heck, my wife's got a traveling job. I'm home alone a lot. I can do things like that. So I read it. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I'm very proud of her. She's been in. Algeria and Sur Algeria, Bosnia in two days. But here's the deal. When, when uh, he did that, he made a very important point. He said, look, you can't really balance a budget unless you have three things. That's what Simpson Bowles Commission said. It said you've got to have adequate spending controls, an adequate revenue base for the money you've decided you have to spend, and you've got to have a certain amount of economic growth because when there is no growth, as we saw during the financial crash, tax receipts drop a lot because so many people are unemployed and businesses aren't making money, and, and costs go up because more people draw unemployment and food stamps and things like that. That's the way those programs were designed to help get through tough spouts, and this was the toughest one since the Great Depression. So there was this plan. Now, here's the good news. We're coming out of this crash mentality and this terrible economic crisis we've been in. We've had 5.3 million jobs in the last 32 months. That's twice what we had in the previous seven years and eight months before the crash. And new housing starts, auto purchases at a four-year high, biggest one-year drop in unemployment since 1995, we're coming out. It's very interesting that just in the last few weeks, two business organizations having nothing to do with the Democratic Party, but not arms of the Republican Party either, Moody's and a group called Microeconomic Advisors both say, if we just don't mess it up, America's going to generate 12 million jobs in the next four years, based on their analysis. And we had about 22.7 million in my eight years, so that 12 million adjusted for inflation, for cha changing population, it would be about what we had. It would be great. It would take unemployment down to 6% nationally, maybe 5 and maybe down to zero in North Dakota. Yours is so low here. <laughs> but the point is, that's going to happen. That's the good news. But for the budget, it's sobering news. Why? Because there is a reason with all this debt why interest rates are so low. Interest rates are below inflation today, and the debt has not been a burden lately because economic growth all around the world is so low and people think America is a better bet to put their money in than just about any place else. But when the economy starts to grow and you take out a farm loan to bring in a crop, a new small, more small businesses want to borrow money. Other people borrow money to start new businesses or expand them. 
then there'll be a lot more competition for the money that the government essentially is borrowing without competition, and interest rates will start to go up. And it will be paralyzing to us unless we do something about this debt. I'll just give you one example. Today, in our great big federal budget, interest payments on the national debt are about $250 billion a year, and that's because the interest rates are below the rate of inflation. If interest rates today were what they were when I was president, the annual payments would be $650 billion a year, bigger than the defense budget. And you could kiss federal aid to education goodbye. You could kiss this farm bill goodbye. You could kiss a lot of things goodbye. We would be choking on debt. So how should we avoid that? Pass a 10-year debt reduction plan. Pass the plan along the outline of Simpson Bowles. Have at least $2 in spending cuts for every dollar in new revenue, and ask those of us who were the beneficiaries of the tax cuts of the 90s and the economic growth, not the 90s, the last decade. We were all beneficiaries in the 90s. <laughs> but the truth is, in the last decade, almost all the economic growth went to the top 10% and a disproportionate amount to the top 1% of us who also got a disproportionate amount of the tax cuts. It's not too much to ask us to kick in a little to help balance the budget. That's what Simpson Bowles said. Now, and the plan that Kent voted for says you should start slow so we don't mess up the recovery and really put the pedal down as the economy grows to keep interest rates down so Americans can afford to make those crop loans and to take them out and the small business loans, and all these other credit things we need to grow this economy. It's just common sense. Now, the difference is, if you send Heidi to the Senate, I think she will apply that kind of common sense, the kind you take for granted from Kent Conrad, and the kind that I have not seen from Heidi's opponent who repeatedly votes for even more tax cuts for the highest income earners, including himself. And look, you know, if this were just a money grab, I should be for the other guys. I never had a nickel to my name until I got out of the White House, and now I am in that 1%. And you know what? I get up every morning, and I'm proud of my country. I thank God for the opportunities I've had. I keep my money in America and I'm happy to pay what I owe. And, and so, it's important for North Dakota that you be a force for common sense reduction of this debt. And it's important you send somebody that will have credibility and knows how to get along with people and knows how to listen to them and knows how to make agreements. You know she can do that. And you know her opponent won't do that because he votes 100% of the time with the Tea Party ideologues that don't want to do it. Don't forget. Now, let me just give you a couple of examples. The United States Senate passed a great farm bill. At least I thought it was a good bill. Saved about $23 billion, took care of the farmers, took care of the crop insurance issue, dealt with a lot of the things that had been kind of unresolved for years. It was a good bill. Passed the Senate, couldn't get it by the ideologues in the House. Send Heidi Heitkamp to Washington. I bet she'll help pass a farm bill that we need. I'll give you another example. This health care deal, I've heard more stuff on that. She's got it right. She says, look, it's not perfect, but the last thing you want to do is repeal it. Let's fix it. Now, why is that the right position? For this reason. The worst thing you could do is stay with the status quo. Today, the U.S. spends in frugal North Dakota, I want you to listen to this. The United States spends 17.8% of its income on health care. The next most expensive system in a big country 
is in France at 11.8%. Almost every other big rich country has a higher rated health care system than we do in terms of life expectancy and the speed of care. And as you know, we don't insure about 40 million people. How could we spend that? The difference for us in 17.8 and 11.8 is, listen to this, $1 trillion a year, every year. Now, why shouldn't you repeal the law? Because for the last two years, inflation has been cut in half, 4% or less, two years in a row for the first time in 51 years. Last week, there was this huge headline in USA Today saying that one big reason in the last decades, so many middle class, hardworking people never got a pay raise, is their employers were spending all the profits paying for their health insurance premiums. Because they were being eaten alive by it. Is it a perfect bill? No, you can't deal with the subject that big without making some errors. They've already cleaned up some of the small business reporting requirements. But should you want people with pre-existing conditions to be able to buy health insurance? I think so. Why? Because they see the doctor sooner, when it's less expensive, and when they do, they live longer. It's just clear there's huge amounts of evidence. You can actually save money and improve health care. I'll give you just another example. We've got 3 million people under the age of 26 who are being carried on their parents' health insurance policy for the first time. We have had... And here's the real deal. You want to know why they want to repeal it instead of fix it? Here's why. Because there's already been $1.3 billion in refunds to people on their insurance premiums because the law now requires 80 to 85% of your premium to go to your health care, not to profits and promotion. And that's really important. So... Heidi's been very specific. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what I'd like to try to change. And every time her opponent has voted 30 times to repeal it, is asked what he'd substitute for it, he doesn't have anything to say. Well, I'm just telling you, I spent a lifetime studying this, and I'm not running for anything. I know how this works. My cardiologist would be appalled if this bill were repealed. My next door neighbor is a 70-year-old pediatric heart surgeon who is a good old-fashioned Catholic layman who would be appalled if this bill were repealed. The people who live with the old system say it is an administrative nightmare that spends, listen to this, listen to this, 200 billion dollars a year more in paperwork costs than we would spend if we had any other country's health system. So I say, let's send a practical per person up there to Washington, D.C., who will fix what's wrong and keep what's right and keep America moving forward. The only choice you have is Heidi Heidkamp. Now, let me give you another example. This is a huge deal. The United States has dropped in the last decade, for the first time since World War II in the GI Bill, from second to 16th in the world in the percentage of our young people with four-year college degrees. Think about that. Now, not everybody needs a college degree, but in the 21st century, most jobs will be created by people who have them. And the consequences of not doing this right are enormous. I'll give you just one example. We don't all have the oil and gas you've got, but there's every year a demand for 120,000 people with degrees in computer science. You know how many computer sciences we're producing every year? 40,000. Today, Microsoft wants to hire 6,000 and cannot. Well, why is this dropout rate happening? Two reasons. One is college costs have gone up at twice the rate of inflation. We have to change the delivery model. 
And there's now an initiative coming out of the administration that I think Heidi would be perfect to work on thinking about how all over America we can cut the cost of this and cut the inflation rate by 50%. And it shouldn't be a partisan issue. Rick Perry, who sought the Republican presidential nomination and said nearly nothing I agreed with, has done an interesting thing in Texas. He has challenged every institution of higher education to devise a $10,000 degree that would be high quality and easily accredited. So what if they don't make it? If they get a $20,000 degree, they're way ahead of where we are now. This is the kind of thing we gotta do. What's the other big problem? Kids are scared to take on more debt and afraid they'll never be able to repay it. Now, starting next year, the student loan reform does this. It sets aside a reserve, makes the loans direct through the campuses. Every college in North Dakota will certify people eligible for the loan. The young people will get the loans at lower interest rates, and most important, for the first time, every single person in the U.S. that gets one of these loans will have the option to pay it back as a low fixed percent of their income for up to 20 years. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? If you care about this, this alone is enough to vote for Heidi Heitkamp for Senate. Because what this means is that nobody will ever have to drop out of college again because they're afraid they won't be able to pay their debt. What if somebody from North Dakota goes to medical school and gets out with a debt of over $200,000, which is the average? And they say, you know, I'd love to go out into a small rural area and be a family doctor. I'd like to take two days a week to go practice medicine among the Native Americans. I'd like to take care of people who don't have access to health care. But I owe $200,000. Today, they couldn't do that, so they go take a specialty, and they go to the city, and they earn more money so they can pay off their debt. Now, under this new system, their debt every year will be determined by their salary, not the other way around. <laughs> Same thing for teachers, for nurses, for firefighters, for police officers. It's a huge deal. And believe it or not, you can ask Kent, if you don't believe me, that this is $60 billion cheaper over 10 years than the old system, which basically the old system paid fees to banks to charge market interest rates and guaranteed 90% of the loan. So we saved $60 billion, and what the Congress did was to take that money and guarantee increases in the Pell Grants every year and guarantee that middle-class families would be able to keep the tuition tax credits for sending their kids to school. It's a huge deal for a 10 years. It is revolutionary. We will rise again among the ranks of people with college degrees. So, what does her opponent and all of his crowd in Washington want to do? You're not going to believe this. They want to repeal that, give the money back to the banks, raise the cost of the student loans, make them harder to repay, not fund the Pell Grants, not fund the tuition tax credit. In other words, if they do that, you can do that. Everybody can do that with their vote. But if it happens, don't complain if four years from now, instead of 16th, we're 20th. And we keep compromising the future of America. That's a big reason to vote for Heidi Heitkamp. You want a practical person who understands what it takes to get people through college. And I'll give you another example. I asked Heidi on the way in, I said, now, has your opponent attacked you, even though you weren't in Congress, for robbing Medicare? You all seen all that? Robbing Medicare. Now, as I said in at the Democratic Convention, it takes some real brass to attack somebody for doing what you did. Because he voted for Congressman Ryan's budget, which had exactly the same savings. 
And Heidi wasn't there. She didn't vote for anything. But look, here's what happened. A group of medical professionals, including doctors, and the AARP said, you got too much inflation in this Medicare program. The costs are going up too much. And you don't need to budget this much. Save this money. You will add eight years to the life of the Medicare trust fund. It won't go broke in 2016. You've got till 2024 to bring health care costs down and figure out what to do with Medicare. It's a big deal. And meanwhile, you can use the money to close the donut hole in the senior drug program, which saves people in North Dakota who are in that program over 500 bucks a year. And it'll help pay for people with pre-existing conditions to get health insurance. Now, it's a good deal. North Dakota is supposed to be a frugal place. Why would you pay for something, pay more than you need to? But they said now, Governor Romney and his crowd, they're going to put the $716 billion back because they say that insurance companies will get so mad they won't provide Medicare Advantage anymore if we don't give them the money that doctors say they don't need, that the AARP says they don't need. So essentially, her opponent thinks he knows more about what's good for seniors than the AARP. I mean, what kind of upside down world are we living in here now? What they really want to do is give the money to the insurance companies. Let's just cut the deal. Follow the money. And here's what I want you to remember. And I want you to talk to people. Anybody in North Dakota that throws this up to you, I want you to talk to them. If this were a disaster, it would already have occurred because those savings are in the budget now. That is, they're paying at a lower rate. Guess what happened to the Medicare Advantage program last year under the new budget? You had a record number of insurance companies wanting to provide the program. You had 17% more seniors in it, and the cost for them dropped 16% because there was so much competition among the insurance companies. They're wrong. This is a stronger Medicare program, and don't you let Heidi Heidkamp lose a vote on it. This is the right position. She's got ideas that'll save you even more money. And this is even before you get to, as she pointed out, the examples of $70 billion in overpayment and the fact that they don't bargain like Medicaid does for drug prices. I'm just telling you, you want a practical person. There is so much ideology and so much special interest lawmaking in Washington, and what you really need is evidence and common sense. And just do and follow the do-right rule. I saw where... Her opponent said she was against fracking the other day. I know something about fracking. I was governor of Arkansas. We got a lot of natural gas. And I agree with Heidi's position. You do need to have good standards, mostly for the wells, interestingly enough, more than the fracking equipment. There's only two or three companies that make that, and it's all pretty good. But what happens if you find a ton of natural gas and everybody wants to get on the deal, huge numbers of people will come in that have never really done much of it before, and they'll drill those wells as quick as they can. You've got to have high standards, because when the water comes back up with the chemicals and the tailings in it, you want to make sure there's no surface pollution and no underground pollution. And you don't want those well casings leaking. But every state's geology is different. Heidi says we ought to have good standards and then we ought to do it. And North Dakota has enough sense to set the right standards. In my state, there's no difference between what Republicans and Democrats want in a gas well. We want one that'll bring up the gas and won't pollute the land. And I think that's what you want and that's what she wants and that's what we ought to do. Anyway, you get it. On issue after issue after issue, she also says that we ought to get the wind credits extended. And it'll send a big message because in fairness, her opponent, since there's so many North Dakota farmers who are Republicans who like those wind credits, he did try to get it done, but he couldn't. Why? Because it violates the ideology of his block in Congress 
who don't want to spend a nickel to see the cow jump over the moon when it comes to solar and wind. But let me tell you something. There's 75,000 people working in the wind industry today, and the price has dropped by two-thirds in the last three years. There's 100,000 people working in solar today, and the price has dropped by two-thirds in the last three years. America ranks first or second in the world in the ability to generate electricity from those sources. Germany, where the sun shines on average as much as it does in London, not much, <laughs> on a bright sunny day last spring, generated the equivalent of 20 nuclear power plants worth of solar power. And Deutsche Bank says it generated 300,000 jobs for them. We have just scratched the surface. President George W. Bush's energy department, not mine, not President Obama's, President Bush's energy department said that on a windy day, North Dakota could generate enough electricity to electrify 25% of America if you had the right sort of modern transmission. So this is the last thing I'll leave you with. Here's a bipartisan idea that Heidi has supported that the Republicans used to be for that they've abandoned. Just about everybody recognizes now we need to lower the corporate income tax, and unlike the rest of what they're saying about the budget, you can make these numbers add up. You can repeal a lot of deductions that corporations get and lower the rate. Right now, corporations pay anything from 35 to 15 percent of their income in taxes. So we need to split the difference, bring it down to the international average, and eliminate the deductions. And they've got hundreds of billions of dollars overseas, which they haven't repatriated because they've already paid taxes over there, and they don't want to pay the difference with the American tax. So she says, let them bring it back if they invest it in American jobs. If they invest it in American jobs. When President Bush tried to bring it back, there was no requirement, and they didn't invest it in American jobs. For years, there has been a bipartisan consensus now abandoned in Washington that we ought to set up an infrastructure bank, that it's crazy for America to be the only big country that doesn't get any private capital to go with public capital to invest in modern infrastructure. If we did that, bring your money home for free, but put some of its infrastructure bank, and we'll guarantee you a good return, and then we can have a modern electrical grid that will connect to places where the wind blows to where the people are. You think the farmers have done well with wind, you ain't seen nothing yet till we do that. You want people to be able to make a living doing anything in rural America? You gotta have modern broadband. South Korea's download speeds are four times ours. With just a little money, we could have people in every rural community and every Native American reservation in the United States having the same computer download speeds, then people literally could do anything anywhere. Entrepreneurs could live anywhere. It doesn't cost much money. You could do it in an infrastructure bank. It's a bipartisan idea that a common sense person like Heidi Heidkamp could get done in Washington, D.C. if you send the right signal. So. This is the last thing I want to say. Look, this is good for North Dakota. But you got to decide what signal you want to send to America. Because all over America, people say, oh, I just hate all this partisanship. And then election time comes around, and they reward it. One of the finest Republican senators in the United States Senate, who voted against me nearly all the time, but I loved him, was Dick Luger from Indiana. He was a genuine patriot and their re resident expert on national security matters. And you should be grateful to him because when the Soviet Union fell, he and Senator Sam Nunn set up a fund to secure the nuclear weapons in all the countries that made up the old Soviet Union. And it saved us from Lord only knows, we will never know how many attempts by terrorist groups and other renegades to steal nuclear material. Dick Luger was a great man. He was defeated in the Republican primary by a man who said his greatest joy in life was imposing his will on someone else, that Luger should be reprimanded for cooperating with a president of another party 
on national security affairs, and what Washington really needs is more partisanship. Now, we're going to see whether the people of Indiana agree with that or not. If you took a poll and you asked them if they agreed with any of that, they'd say, no, I hate it. Watch how they vote. That's the same thing. You cannot say in North Dakota, you want bipartisan common sense and walk away from a woman who's given you nothing but bipartisan common sense all of her life in favor of an ideologue. If you want it, you got to fight for it, you got to vote for it, and you need to send America a message that we need more of it everywhere by electing Heidi Heidkamp to the Senate. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Small town girl